right. The countdown has ended and it's time to begin. I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, when uh, two or more are gathered in his name, he is here. So we're here to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, there are a few uh, things in the bulletin to pay attention to. Uh, you can uh, look at that. Uh, I want to highlight the stamp ministry. Uh, the stamp ministry is uh, through uh, Alliance Stamp Ministry, which uh, is a, uh, a fundraiser where they take your used stamps and then those are sold to stamp collector auction uh, uh, houses, I guess. And then the proceeds go to providing um, uh, uh, Bible lessons uh, in the uh, in the Spanish-speaking countries, Latin America, Spain, things like that. And so this is a program that that Inga has uh, supported uh, and has been very involved with. And we want to encourage uh, that to continue. And if you are collecting your used stamps. Uh, be sure to bring them to the church office. Thank you. Um, also, uh, the women's ministry is, uh, uh, they're having a, uh, a dinner and fellowship event on May 2nd at six o'clock. And then also this summer, we're gonna have a uh, teaching uh, ministry on heaven. And uh, it'll be on uh, Sunday evenings, there'll be a, a teaching time and then uh, fun and games like uh, volleyball like we did before while the, the sun, uh, while the sunlight is available. So uh, fortunately there's lots of sun in the summer. So uh, let me read uh, Psalm uh, 7 and uh, I just want to say that you know this side of the cross uh, our righteousness is really Christ's righteousness granted to us. Let me read uh, uh, Psalm 7, or I should say, this side of the cross we know that our righteousness, because it's um, salvation has always been, it will be and looking either forward to Christ or looking or uh, resting on what he has accomplished. O oh Lord my God, I take refuge in you. Save and deliver me from all who pursue me, for they will tear me like a lion and rip me to pieces with no one to rescue me. O Lord my God, if I have done this, and there is guilt on my hands, if I have done evil to him who is at peace with me, or without cause who robbed my foe, then let my enemy pursue and overtake me. Let him trample my life to the ground and make me sleep in the dust. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Rise up against the rage of my enemies. Awake, my God, decree justice. Let the assembled peoples gather around you, rule over them from on high, and let the Lord judge the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness, according to my integrity, O Most High, O righteous God, who searches minds and hearts, bring to an end the violence of the wicked and make the righteous secure. My shield is my God Most High, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge, a God who expresses his wrath every day. If he does not relent, he will sharpen his sword. He will bend the string of his bow. He has proclaimed his deadly weapons. He makes ready his flaming arrows. He who is pregnant with evil and conceives trouble gives birth to disillusionment. He who digs a hole and scoops it out falls in the pit he has made. The trouble he causes recoils on himself. His violence comes down to his own head. I will give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness and will sing praise to the, his name, the Lord Most High. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we come to you to worship you, to um, uh, gather, to study your word. Uh, Lord, we just pray for the worship team that, uh, that, that their hearts will be honoring you, that our hearts together we would be a sweet aroma to you. Lord, we just pray for uh, Pastor David as he prepares and brings the word to us, Lord, that it would fall on 
uh, receptive ears that we would uh, honor you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Will you stand and join with us as we sing praise to our God, immortal, invisible. favorites shine jesus shine <laughs>
before the throne of God above. I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. Christ intercedes for us daily. Praise him. beautiful prayer be still my soul and I'm sure for all of you as well but for us it's been a very difficult last year couple of years and it can be so reassuring to just lay it all at God's feet and pray, be still, my soul. Be still, my soul, the Lord is on your side. Bear patiently the of grief or pain, leave to your God to order and provide. In every change, be faithful will remain. Be still, my soul.
be seated. Well, thank you, faithful worship team. We've entered into God's house. God's house is a house of prayer. And I praise God that we have corporate prayer during uh, our worship service on Sunday mornings. Um, what I want to do is focus on a couple of things, praise and petition, and give you two verses. Psalm 100, verse 4, you know this. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with what? Praise. Let's remember thanksgiving and praise. And then in petition, there, is a, there are a lot of things to pray for. And as you look in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, we have the armor of God. And 18 is... Part of that armor. It's all part of the same sentence. It's linked to verse 17 um, where we pick up the sword of the Spirit. With all prayer in verse 18, Paul says, and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And then he goes on to ask for personal prayer for himself that in the opening of his mouth he might boldly proclaim the mysteries of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, which should prompt us to not only petition for our church family, but to pray before Pastor David takes the pulpit. So uh, you go ahead and pray, and when it's time, I will close.
Lord, we thank you for this beautiful morning and the freedom to gather together in the house, dear Jesus, which you call the house of prayer. We thank you for who you are and what you've done. Dear Father, your infinite justice, um, your perfect distribution of wrath in accordance with your wise justice, your infinite mercy, and your willingness to pour out your wrath and justice upon Jesus Christ, that without violating who you are, you might freely give mercy to those who call upon you and confess Christ as their Savior, their Lord, through faith alone, as a gift. We would bring one individual, uh, Jay, I, I, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, it's either Perot or Peralt, who is in harm's way right now in the hospital with sepsis and with um, some heart um, implants that could make the spread of sepsis even more threatening than it already is. Give peace to the entire family and intervene for Jay to rescue him. And just amen to Al's prayer for Pastor David, that while preaching, he would know the peace beyond all comprehension and that his strength would be through the fruit of the Holy Spirit's joy and that we would have hearts that rush to receive your word and to be effectual doers. In Jesus' name, amen. Morning. Uh, yesterday morning, uh, Cici and I ventured into uh, the great outdoor of San Ines wilderness. We went up to um, Figueroa Mountain to see the blooms. It was really pretty. Really enjoy the outdoor. Uh, you know, when you, everyone's, every, every one of you has cameras to take pictures, right? Whether you're an, an um, whether you have an Apple device or Google, whatever you have. I have an Apple, so I was able to take a lot of pictures. Sometimes we take for granted, you know, our technology. And I'm not bragging about technology here. But, you know, knowing a little bit of some of the technology in the, uh, in the camera, I know most of our cameras use CMOS sensors. And you got more than one, uh, either you have three or four different sensors that can take really wide pictures or photos and you can tele uh, tele uh, focus a lot of these you know and and the way they made this cameras are very intricate with a lot of lenses and different type of sens sensors and different type of uh, electronic te te technology but I'm not bragging about te technology here this morning what I'm uh, what I'm uh, uh, to share is the the amazing about God's words because I'm this is to me is the most Im important for us as as a living uh, church for for the Lord um, just by way of comparison uh, the word of God tells us in Psalm 19 that the law of the Lord is perfect restoring the soul the testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple the precepts of the Lord are right, restoring the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold. Yes, much finer than gold. Sweeter than the honey and the dripping of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them... Your servant is warned, and in keeping them, there is great reward. Let us pray for our offering. Lord, we just thank you this day that you're, you serve a God that is holy and righteous and true. Lord, we thank you for the life that we have in Christ. We pray, Lord, for our church today and, and the offering which we 
give, Lord, for your kingdom. We pray that this would go out and advance your kingdom from all four corners of this world. We pray, Lord, that with all the missionaries in which we support, you would be with them, Lord, protect them. We pray for your spirits, Lord, of guidance and, Lord, just uh, providing all the resources that they need, Lord, from this point on forward. We just offer this prayer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you, Dana. Appreciate that. Kids are dismissed for Children's Church. You can uh, follow the Watts out there if you're heading out. And the rest of us can turn our Bibles to Luke 24. Luke chapter 24. Uh, this is becoming more bittersweet each week. There are only, including today, three more messages uh, before we wrap the book up and as I've studied again and again um, it's just a joy to go through this but it's also I'm I'm sad that we're leaving Luke soon the last few weeks as we've gone from Resurrection Sunday and Easter to the present day one of the things that kind of caught me by surprise a little bit in, in Luke here is that every single section from the crucifixion on has been about the resurrection 
the resurrection is central. It's, it is not only the center of the Gospels, but it is the center of the church. There is no single doctrine more important than the resurrection. The Trinity is not more important than the resurrection. The virgin birth is not more important than the resurrection. Our view of end times is not more important than the resurrection. In fact, the Christian faith stands or falls with the resurrection. Paul makes that so clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If we have believed in the resurrection, but the resurrection, the dead don't rise, and we are of all men most to be pitied, Paul said. Most to be pitied. Why? Because we have believed in the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on the whole world. If we believe that a dead person rose from the grave and is alive today, we are fools. But if a dead person really did rise from the dead then he has overcome the power of death. And so what does that mean for us? If you're young, you're not even thinking about death. But the older you get, the more you begin to think about it. The body begins to weaken hair begins to grow out of your ears weird things start to happen that you wish wouldn't happen and you realize you are on an inexorable march to your own death and so it becomes a little more important to you that question that naggles at the back of your mind is there life after death? If there isn't, then this world is all you get. If there isn't, then carpe diem, seize the day. Suck the morrow out of life. Live big, go big. Get all you can from this world, because that's all you get, baby, that's it. But what if there is life after death? Then I want to know how I get there. And I want to know if there's really hope. And I, I want to know what happens when I die. Do I just go into the ground? Become part of this great big circle of life? Or is there more? Luke, in his gospel, is so clear that someone died and rose from the dead. And that he, when he did that, he conquered death. He overcame its power. He overcame its sting. And the Lord Jesus Christ is that one who has overcome the grave. And because He lives, we can live. If we have received the gift of grace by faith in Jesus Christ, we too can have the assurance that life does not end when this physical body stops, but life continues. But it all hinges on one simple truth. The Lord lives. The Lord lives. He didn't just rise from the dead. He lives. I like what Alistair Begg said. It's in your notes. Jesus is risen. He's not 2,000 years away. He is here and you may call on him and find him to be a savior and a friend and a king this is right now right here the Lord 
lives. Today we are going to see three proofs that the Lord Jesus Christ lives. We're going to see a powerful testimony, which is really three. We're going to see a shocking appearance, and we're going to see a compelling invitation. Let's look at our text. Let me read it for us, and then we'll go back and study it together. Verse 33. You remember the story picks up where Jesus has traveled the road to Emmaus with his two disciples. The disciples, they're traveling it, and and Jesus joins the, the little group. But they don't recognize who he is, and so they have this conversation, and Jesus says, what are you guys talking about? He says, well, we're talking about what happened in Jerusalem. Well, what happened in Jerusalem? Are you kidding me? You were there, and are you the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't know what happened? No, tell me. Actually, he didn't say no. He just said, tell me. He began to tell him the story. And then Jesus said to them, O foolish men, and heart of heart to believe in all that was spoken by the prophets in the scriptures. The scriptures not say that the Son of Man would be beaten and killed and crucified and rise again. And they invited him into their home for dinner. And at the dinner he took the loaf of bread and he broke it and he began to pray over it. And in their hearts, in their hearts they knew this was Jesus and just as their eyes were open spiritually and they knew beyond a reasonable shadow of a doubt that this was Jesus he vanished this is where we pick up the story because they're still at the dinner table they're still holding the bread that he just passed to them and this is where verse 33 picks up and they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, The Lord really has risen and has appeared to Simon. And they began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. And while they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still could not believe it, because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, Do you got anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Let's begin with a powerful testimony. And I really want to look at three. There are three powerful testimonies that combine to show us that Jesus is alive. <clears throat> I once worked for a company that was involved in a lawsuit and I was called to come in and give a deposition. <coughs> and I remember it was kind of a scary thing. There were uh, three of us from the company that were called in and um, we had attorneys on both sides. We met in a neutral lawyer's office and while, we, while I sat there, they began to ask me questions. And I was very much aware that this could go to trial and I would be called upon to testify again. And so I better make sure that what I said was truthful and accurate to the best of my knowledge. And so I was very careful because you know how those wily attorneys are, right, Blaine? They're always trying to, trying to get you to say something you didn't mean to say or, or trick you over here. Or at least that's the way you feel based on watching TV shows and stuff. And, and that was my only experience. And so I went in wondering but knowing that my testimony needed to be true. A testimony is a powerful thing. It is one person promising to tell the truth. The ministry of the church is to testify about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. 
the ministry of the church is first and foremost to testify about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is our primary function and purpose. That's why we're here. But where did this all begin, this idea of testifying for Jesus Christ? I want us to consider three powerful testimonies that we've seen in Luke's Gospel and we see in the other Gospels. There's really only two in this passage, but there's a third I want to bring in, and it's the women's testimony. The women's testimony. Now, although women's testimony isn't clear in Luke, it is found elsewhere, and so I'm going to be looking at Matthew chapter 28 to kind of exposit that for us. Mary's testimony and the testimony of the women is important for a number of reasons, and I want to point out the most important one. Jesus appeared to the women first before any of his other disciples. Which is really interesting because if you were crafting a religion or if you were crafting a story to tell people, you probably wouldn't point to women as your first witnesses. Why? Because in that time, in that culture, the weight of a woman's testimony was considered less than a man's. And so it would make sense that you would want the strongest argument up first, and so you would appear to men and have a man's testimony, and then maybe come in with the women later. But that's not what the Gospel writers do. They actually present the way they find it, and it is that Jesus first appeared to the women. That should give you some encouragement about the authenticity of the Scriptures, by the way. God never shies away <clears throat> from showing us truths that seem to be detrimental to the way we would expect to find them. Matthew 28, verses 9 through 10. And behold, Jesus met them, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, and greeted them. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. I want you to notice three things about the women in their witness and what they did. The first is that they reported the angel's words. When they went to the tomb, the tomb was opened, and there were two angels who told them that Jesus wasn't there because he was what? He was risen. They were faithful in recording those words to the rest of the disciples. That's a powerful testimony right there. They reported the angel's words. Secondly, they reported their meeting with Jesus. In John chapter 20, verse 18, we read this. Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. That was her testimony. The third thing that they reported were Jesus' words themselves. In Matthew 28, verse 10. And Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. They were faithful in every account. They were faithful to record the words of the angels. They were faithful to record the words of Christ. And they were faithful to record their meeting with Jesus. This is a powerful eyewitness testimony. We know that they reported everything to the disciples, but each time, here's the irony, every time they reported to the disciples, the disciples refused to believe them. Now, if you were making up a story, wouldn't you want everybody to agree? Wouldn't you want everybody to buy into the story? Again, God is showing us that he's okay with tension. He's okay with displaying the fact that Thomas doubted. He's okay with showing us that the apostles doubted. He's okay with all those things. Now, whether their lack of belief in what the women told them was related to the cultural norm of not valuing a woman's testimony with as much weight as a man's, or that they were simply unwilling to believe, we don't know which is the case. But the simple truth is that fear discouragement and disappointment had overwhelmed them emotionally and they were not ready to believe in the resurrection even though they had incredible testimonies that's the women's testimony 
second testimony belongs to Peter. Peter's testimony. Let's look at verse 34. <clears throat> they were saying, the Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. Now, we have the words of the eleven as they heard them from Simon. Simon, who's also known as Peter, who's also known as Cephas. <coughs> Before those two disciples from the Emmaus journey ever got to tell their part of the story, the larger group excitedly shares the news about the resurrection. Talk about pulling the, the, the rug out from under your feet. <clears throat> Those two disciples on the road to Emmaus had traveled through the night in the dark seven miles to tell the rest about Jesus, and the minute they get there, they go, hey, hey, wait a minute, before you guys say anything, we just want you to know, Jesus is risen. Ah. Uh, yeah we came all the way here to tell you that but this is peter's testimony peter has told the group that jesus has appeared to him now the interesting thing is is that the gospels don't record that for us there's no story of that in the gospels anywhere it's only mentioned here but there is one other place that it's mentioned, and it's 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 5. Let me read it to you. The Apostle Paul writes, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised up on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, and then the twelve. That's the only other corroboration of Peter's testimony. But it is a powerful testimony, and it's a testimony that was enough for all the others to accept. So what do we have so far in this series of powerful testimonies? We have the women's testimony, we have Peter's testimony, but we're not done, because now we have the testimony of the two disciples from the road to Emmaus, who have just arrived, knocked on the door, come in, and begun to tell their story before they were interrupted. Verse 35. They, that is those two disciples, began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. Now let's consider these two disciples and what we learned about them from the last time. They had an amazing encounter with Jesus on the road. They were going from Jerusalem seven miles to this little village. We don't really know where it is, but it's seven miles away. They're traveling during the day, and on that journey, a traveler joins them. It's Jesus, but they can't see and tell that it's him. He begins to ask them about the things they're talking about, and, and the story begins to unravel. In fact, they even mention that the women had told them that Jesus rose from the grave, had seen the angels... They told Jesus that Peter had run to the tomb, looked inside and saw that it was empty. And then it says that Jesus opened up the scriptures and began to reveal to them everything pertaining to Jesus from Moses to the prophets. He took them through the Old Testament. He opened up the scriptures and explained it to them so they could understand the prophecies pointing to Jesus pieces were all coming together their eyes were spiritually open and then they saw their risen savior jesus when he broke the bread at the end of that moment they're standing there it's just the two of them jesus has vanished they look at each other and they say we got to go back by this time it's likely nine to ten o'clock at night and they have a seven mile hike back to jerusalem People usually didn't travel during the night because it wasn't safe. They would wait for the day. They would wait till it was light and there were other people around. But this message that they had to share was so urgent, it could not wait until the next morning. And so they leave. <coughs> we don't know what time they arrived. It was probably early hour mornings. When they arrived... 
we can only guess how excited they were when they knocked on the door. The whole trip there, thinking about what Jesus had said, talking about the story, excited to tell the others Jesus was really risen. It was really true. They'd seen it themselves. They knock on the door. The door is unlocked. The door is opened. And before they can say a single word, the others already know. The Lord is alive. The evidence is mounting. What more could they possibly want or need? Well, what they need is a shocking appearance. And we see this in verses 36 and 37. <clears throat> While they were telling these things, he himself stood there in their midst and said to them, Peace be to you. I want you to notice that first, the other disciples had interrupted them. And before they could finish the whole story again, Jesus comes and interrupts their story a second time. Put yourself in the sandals of these two disciples for a moment. You've just got all this information bottled up inside your heart. You want to tell it, and you get interrupted. Then you get a, a breather, a pause, and you get to start telling the story, and you, you're telling the story, and as you're telling it, all of a sudden everyone's eyes go in a different direction than you. Because somehow, with the door locked in the middle of the night, Jesus is right there in the middle of the whole group. And your story gets stopped again. But it's because Jesus is there. He's there in the flesh. The Lord is alive. Let's consider first their response to what they see, and then Jesus' response in his greeting. We're going to jump to verse 37 for a moment. But they were startled and frightened and thought they were seeing a spirit. How did they respond? They responded with fear. They responded with fear. Why? Because they, they saw Jesus, but they thought it was a spirit. And it reminded me of one of the opening scenes from one of my favorite stories of all time, A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. I hope you've read it, but if you haven't, let me bring you up to speed. The main character is Ebenezer Scrooge. His name has become a word we use to talk about people who are tight with their money. People who don't like to splurge, people who won't help you out, people who are kind of greedy. We call them a Scrooge. And so Ebenezer Scrooge was. He was wealthy, but he lived like a miser because he didn't even want to spend money on himself. He has a former business partner whose name was Jacob Marley who had died seven years earlier. And Scrooge comes home at the end of the day and he goes to put the key in the door to unlock the door. The door knocker begins to change and he sees the face of his business partner, Jacob Marley. And boy, is he startled. And then it disappears. He finishes unlocking the door. He goes inside. He has his evening meal. It's described as a bowl of gruel. That sounds appetizing. He then goes into his parlor next to his bedroom where there's a very small fire burning that's so small he has to get close to it and wait a while before he can even feel any warmth coming from it. This is how miserly he is. And he changes and gets ready for bed, and, and he's thinking about the door knocker, and he's a little bit scared, so he goes and he locks the door, only this time he does what he's never done before. He locks all of the locks. And then he sits down at the table to finish his gruel, and as he does, the spirit of Jacob Marley comes in, carrying his chains. This is part of the conversation. You don't believe in me, observed the ghost. I don't, said Scrooge. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond your senses? I don't know, said Scrooge. Why do you doubt your senses? Because, said Scrooge, a little thing affects them. 
A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an undone potato. There's more of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. Scrooge was not much in the habit of cracking jokes, nor did he feel in his heart by any means waggish then. The truth is that he tried to be smart as a means of distracting his own attention and keeping down his terror for the specter's voice disturbed the very marrow of his bones. So we can understand if the disciples were startled and fearful. It describes their response to Jesus' sudden, shocking appearance in that locked room. He didn't come through the door. He simply appeared, just as he had simply vanished hours earlier. So was it surprising that they thought he was a spirit or a ghost of some sort? No. (coughs) And let's remember that some of them, the women and John, had witnessed Jesus die on the cross. They had seen the body being taken down. They had followed Nicodemus and Joseph as they took the body to the tomb. They had seen them as they wrapped him up hurriedly, laid him in the tomb, They knew where it was because they were planning on coming back as soon as possible to finish. (coughs) In their minds, Jesus was dead. There was no doubt. And so he responds to their fear and startlement with peace. With peace, verse 36. While they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst, and he said to them, Peace be to you. This brings us back to Jesus' greeting. Peace to you. This was a common, respectful term in those times and in that place. Peace is also the word shalom. Shalom. And the word shalom, the word for biblical peace, is more than what you and I think. We tend to think of peace as what happens when no one's at war with each other. But biblical peace is much more than that. It, it means wellness of being, spirit and body. It has the idea of wholeness, safety, and contentment. And isn't this exactly what the disciples need right at this moment? Not only because of the shocking way that Jesus appeared to them, but because they need divine help in understanding all that's going on around them. In Matthew uh, Matthew 8, verses 23 to 27, Jesus calms the raging seas and the winds with these words, Peace, be still. You see, He is Lord not only over all creation, but of our own hearts and minds too. And Jesus offers his own peace when our world seems chaotic and beyond our control. Here, when nothing seems to make sense, he brings peace to the fear that is bubbling up in their doubting hearts. It is a shocking appearance, and it is followed by a compelling invitation. Verse 38. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Now it didn't take omniscience to see the fear that was bubbling up in their eyes. It didn't take an omniscient, sovereign God to know what was going on there in their hearts he could see it from the outside in but he saw what was going on in their hearts and he saw that fear was bubbling up he saw that doubt was bubbling up you see they doubted their eyes they doubted what they saw and it's interesting that he sees their doubts And he said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? We have an old saying, seeing is what? Seeing is believing. Come on down, folks, because seeing is believing. The first time I asked Rhonda to marry me, and yes, it took more than one time. 
I remember she said to me, show me the ring. <laughs> because seeing is believing. But sometimes seeing isn't enough, and we need help. The disciples already have three separate eyewitness accounts that Jesus has risen from the dead. What more could they need? Well, now Jesus has appeared to all of them. He's right there in front of them. That sounds pretty convincing. But they still would not believe their eyes. Why? Because doubt had crept in and taken over. Doubt is the opposite of faith. Doubt is that wavering of spirit and purpose. Doubt is that lack of conviction, lack of assurance, lack of confidence. Doubt is what happens when we allow fear rather than trust. Lies in place of the truth and unbelief over belief. Jesus saw their doubts and called them to faith in Him. So... <clears throat> He sees their doubts, but secondly, he shows them proof. He doesn't leave them in their doubt. Verse 39, see my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, touch me. Now, if that's not an invitation, I don't know what is. This is a compelling invitation. Was Jesus just a spirit, a ghost, or an apparition that they collectively saw? No, he was a real, physical body that could be touched and felt. And so Jesus invited them to look and see, but not just to look and see, but to actually touch and feel his body to confirm that it was really him. Matthew 28, 9, And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them, and they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. That sounds like a real body to me. John chapter 20, verse 7, Jesus said to Mary, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. That sounds like a real body to me. John chapter 20, verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands and touch here your hand and put it in my side and do not be unbelieving but believing. Listen, you could only do that with a real body. They doubted their eyes. He sees their doubts. He shows them proof. But curiously, they also doubt their own joy. This is a bit of a mystery. Verse 40. <clears throat> and when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Now the idea there is he showed them is he, inv he was inviting them. Come up. He, he, was show he was holding his arms out saying, come on guys, touch it. Go ahead. Feel. Hold. Come close. This is an invitation. It's a compelling invitation. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still could not believe it, why couldn't they believe it? Because of their joy and amazement. Wait. Wait. They doubted their joy? Now they know it's Him. They see that it's Him. They've touched Him. They've felt Him. They know it's Him. And now that fear and doubt has been removed and replaced with joy and amazement. And that prevents them from believing? Have you ever had a moment when something is just so wonderful that you think to yourself, that can't be true. That can't be real. Only you discover that it really is. There's three things we notice here. Verse 40 is their touch. They did touch Him. Verse 41, their joy their joy is evident. Their joy is real. Psalm 34, verse 8 says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in Him. That was the invitation to touch Him. 
their joy. It's such a curious phrase. Immense joy and amazement has overtaken them. It's the sense that it's just too good to be true. And one of my favorite stories in the Bible, not only because the name of the girl is so close to my wife's name, Rhoda and Rhonda, uh, but because of what happens. Let me read to you Acts chapter 12, uh, verses 12 to 16. Peter had been in prison, and the church got real spiritual and said, let's have a corporate prayer gathering. Everybody come, we're going to pray. And they said, yeah, let's do that. And they all came together and they began to pray. And before they prayed, you can almost picture one of the leaders in the group standing up and saying, okay, we're going to pray now. We're going to pray that he would be released from prison. It seems like a long shot, but let's pray for it. And they began to pray. And you can almost hear the prayers of the people gathered together. Lord, we know that you are sovereign over all. And we are trusting you for the deliverance of our brother Peter. And then someone else is praying, God, we know that you only want the best for your people, and you can free him if it's your will. Lord, free him. And someone else is praying for him. Lord, open our eyes. Let us see you do amazing things. And we know you can do it, God, because you are sovereign, you are good, you are kind, you are powerful. And when Peter realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. When he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing at the front gate. And they said to her, You're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. So they kept saying, it's an angel. Does anybody remember what we were just praying? Does anybody remember to whom we are praying? The God who is sovereign, who can release the prisoners, who can open doors. Do you remember all that stuff we were praying about? Did anybody really believe it? I wonder if sometimes we're guilty of praying like that too. I don't mean to cast a bummer on us, but maybe we pray like that, but we really don't believe like that. But she kept insisting that it was so. They kept saying it is angel. But Peter continued knocking. Hello? Will somebody open the door? And when they had opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. The very two same words that were used to describe the disciples' response to Jesus, joy and amazement, are the very same two words that are used in this passage to describe the response of the disciples to Peter being freed and showing up on the doorstep. Their joy. The third thing I want you to notice is their meal. Somebody brought food that night and made fish. They broiled it. While they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? Why would he ask such a question? If they still think, if there's anybody in that group who still has questions about whether or not he's real, the one who stood back and didn't touch him, maybe seeing him eat will be more proof that they just cannot deny. Because ghosts don't eat real food. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Spirit would have no need of food and drink, but a real physical body would. This is additional proof of the resurrection. Earlier, they had been hungry. Someone had prepared broiled fish, and together they all ate. 
Now Jesus has just appeared and made a compelling invitation for them to see and touch him, to know that he was truly risen from the grave. Their fears and doubts are weighing heavily on their hearts, and they just don't know what to believe. And Jesus asks a simple question, do you have anything to eat? And they hand him a piece of fish and wondered if it would fall through his ghostly hands. But it didn't. They might have wondered if he would really be able to eat it, and he did. More proof that this is really Jesus. This morning we have seen powerful testimony that the Lord is alive. A shocking appearance that proves the Lord is alive. And a compelling invitation to believe that the Lord is alive. The evidence is abundant. The testimony is believable. The story of the church is a never-ending telling of the gospel message, which is undeniable. The Lord lives. This is our story. Is it yours? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the resurrection. For it alone is the source of our hope that there is life beyond death for ourselves, for our loved ones. But we are also reminded, Lord, this morning that it comes because of what Christ did on the cross. And we appropriate what He did on the cross by childlike faith in the gift of grace that You freely offer. Where You allow sinners like us to cry out to you and say Lord I believe be my savior take away my sin may my life be raised up from death just as yours was oh Lord help us to be people of the cross help us to be people of the resurrection help us to be the church I pray in Christ's name amen May the Lord bless you and keep you this week. Have a great week.